Happy Sabbath, Brooklyn Church. I don't have to tell you, it's been a long week, but I'm happy we have today to spend time together and with God. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Hope you enjoy.
currently live in a world of fear, anger, depression, and heartache. The year 2020 will be seen in history as, well, special. The ongoing global pandemic has put people in a state of trepidation. In the process, we have lost loved ones and colleagues that were close to our heart. And the virus of racism that has been around for hundreds of years is now being confronted by those who believe in civil rights for all. It seems as though we have done this over and over. From Martin Luther King to Rosa Parks, James Baldwin, Angela Davis, Frederick Douglass, just to name a few who have fought for equality in this country for us. Currently, as I speak these words to you, many are making their voices heard by doing acts such as protesting and even to the extreme of rioting. People from around the world stand with us and march in unity to say, yes, black lives do matter and demand that justice be served to those that racially profile us and also to those that make us take our final breath unwillingly. This country, the so-called land of the free, has never been that way for the black man or woman. We have been oppressed and diluted to being the inferior race. With this in mind, we need help. We need a divine help. You see, Jesus Christ gives us the opportunity to come into his presence and worship him. And he also wants us to lay our burdens at his feet. And even in these uncertain times, he is still there. He is watching us. And we may think that he is not near, but he is right there. He has not forsaken us. So I want to welcome you today to the Brooklyn SDA Church, a place where you can be free, a place where you can pray to God all you want, a place where we all will care about you. And whether you're a member or a visitor, we share the same type of love for everyone. So enjoy your stay and be blessed. Hi guys, good to see you again. As you know, we're learning about Solomon. And what is the thing that Solomon is most known for? Do you remember? No, no, no. Yes, wisdom, good job. He's known for wisdom. Solomon became king, and Solomon could have asked for anything he wanted. And when he became king, he didn't say, okay God, now that I'm king, I want riches, I want popularity, I want this, castles, horses, blah. No, Solomon knew he couldn't do this job on his own. Solomon knew he needed God's help, so Solomon asked for wisdom. And that's what we're gonna be focused on for the next several weeks. And I have another story that I want you to see as Solomon gets into a little bit of a jam, and boy, does he ever need God's wisdom. Take a look. God answered Solomon's prayer and gave him great wisdom. He composed 3,000 wise sayings and wrote a 1,000 songs. He knew all about animals and birds, fish and plants and flowers. He became famous far and wide for his wisdom. God also gave Solomon the skill to deal with all sorts of situations at court. Many of his people came asking for justice, requesting the king to hear their problems. One day, two women arrived and were shown into the king's throne room. One of them was carrying a baby. A soldier took the baby and held it, while the two women poured out their story to the king. We lived together, the first one began, and we both had babies not long ago. My baby was born just two days before hers. One night, she rolled over on her baby by accident and it died. While I was still asleep, she took my baby from beside me and put her dead baby in its place. I woke up to find the baby beside me was dead. When I looked again, I saw that it wasn't my baby at all, but hers. The other woman interrupted angrily. The dead baby was yours, she argued. Mine is the living baby. Yours died. The king let them shout and argue for a moment. Then he asked, are you both claiming that this live baby is yours? Yes, they shouted together. Fetch a sword, the king ordered. A sword was carried in, and Solomon said to one of the soldiers, 
Since both these mothers say the baby is theirs, cut the baby exactly in half and give them half each. At once, the baby's real mother cried out, Don't kill him. I'd rather she have him than for him to be divided. But the other woman said, Go on, do as the king said. It's fair. Stop, Solomon shouted. Don't hurt the baby. I wanted to discover the true mother. The baby belongs to the one who wants to save his life. Give the baby to her. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about the situation of the baby and the two mothers. They thought how wise and clever their king must be if he could think of such a scheme to find out the truth. Hey, well, you could see Solomon had a really tough situation on his hands. He didn't know what to do. He had two moms both saying this was their child. Now, I can tell you this, probably Solomon wasn't really gonna cut the baby in half, but Solomon was doing this to try to find the real mom because the real mom would never want their baby to be harmed. Solomon knew to do this because he had wisdom. It wasn't just because he was smart, he had wisdom. Remember, Solomon really wanted God's wisdom. He knew that he needed wisdom in order to lead the people and to make good judgments, just like the one we saw in the story. There was no way Solomon could do it on his own. And he really wanted God's wisdom. He asked for it, he sought after it. Have you ever lost anything in your bedroom? Like maybe you lost some money, or maybe you lost your phone, or maybe you lost something else. What did you do? You didn't stand there and just say, oh, oh well, I can't find it, no. You went after it, you went looking for it. That's what Solomon did when he went after God for wisdom, when he sought God for wisdom. He prayed and he asked God, please give me wisdom. I can't do this on my own. And this is a great example of God's wisdom at work in Solomon's life. And you and I need God's wisdom too. Because there's a lot of things that come my way and I just don't have, I just don't have what it takes to make the decision on my own. Same thing happens with you. You have a lot of problems and difficulties that come your way, and you need God's wisdom as well. And just like Solomon, you and I can ask God to give us wisdom. And the scripture says that if we ask God for wisdom, he'll give it to us. And that's what we need to make good decisions. Whenever we're faced with temptations, to have the strength to walk away, to know what's right and to know what's wrong, you and I need God's wisdom just like Solomon. And all you have to do is ask. Ask for God to give you wisdom. And then when God does give you wisdom in the form of the Bible or the teaching you hear at church, especially the, the coaching and the guidance that you get from mom and dad, when God's wisdom comes in those ways, we hear it, we accept it, and then we do it. It doesn't mean anything for us to know it and not do it. And that's the wisdom that Solomon had. He knew what to do because God gave him the insight and then he did it. You and I can have the same thing. So this week, pray and ask God to give you wisdom and he will. All right, we love you guys. We'll see you next time. I was living in an unacceptable way to God. As a young man, I began attending parties and drinking. I was also going to clubs. One day, I was at home watching TV when a pastor came on and said, if you ask God to show you his true people, he will show you his church. I didn't know how to talk to God or how to pray, but that night I prayed that God would show me his true church. That was Friday night. The very next morning as I went to fetch water, I met a friend who asked me where I was going. I told him that I was taking a shower to go out, so he invited me to go to church with him. I said, yeah, sure. Then I finished getting water, showered, and went to church with him. I've been in that church ever since and was baptized on May 1st, 2010. I work as a barber. It's from this profession that God blesses me with an income to pay my transport to Caldera, where I go as a missionary. I first went there to preach and I simply fell in love with the people. So I asked my church to send me there as an assistant. Shortly after I arrived, the leader left and I became the main person to head this ministry. It's been a difficult journey, but God goes before me. It can cost me 80,000 dobras round trip. When I can't afford this, 
God gives me the strength to take the bike taxi there and walk the way back. When it's a week of prayer, I do it alone. I go there without anyone. Sometimes the meetings go until eight or nine because many people have questions, and I don't like to leave anyone with doubts. So I walk back with God's company. He is the only one who can keep me safe. I arrive safely. Nothing has happened to me. God has always guided me. The people of Caldera are lovely and like to listen to God's word. Our biggest challenge is the lack of a shelter to worship in. On Wednesdays and Fridays, we worship under a solar-powered light. On Sabbaths, we worship in a tiny house. We are praying that God will bless us to get a roof and shelter. Jesus left us a mission. He said, "Go ye into all the world, making disciples and preaching the gospel to all creatures, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit." This motivates me to take the message of God to this remote group of people. May God's Spirit bless us to further the work in Caldera and to reach the communities around it. If you are watching this video, please pray that God's Spirit will assist us to win this battle and be able to preach the gospel. Hearts always hunger for Oh, our hearts always hunger for You are the one that we praise You are the one we adore You give the healing and grace our Hearts always hunger for Oh, our hearts always hunger for Happy Sabbath, my brothers and sisters, and greetings in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's been a historic week with the unrest, the marches, and the anxiety and the frustration surrounding the death of George Floyd and so many others. But our conference, our union, our division, and the general conference have all made public statements to the present situation in the United States of America. This past Sunday, there were two marches, one by the Greater New York Conference, the other by the Northeastern Conference. In spite of all this, there is so much to give God thanks for, for keeping us safe throughout the week and for providing all the necessities of life for us. We thank God for that. We continue to pray for this nation and for its leadership as we traverse these next few weeks and months as the country is reopened. We ask you to remain safe. Don't drop your guards until it's absolutely safe. Keep wearing your masks and washing your hands. They say sing happy birthday twice. Respect and practice social and physical distancing. Request it from those who have no respect for themselves or for you. The Lord willing, we are hoping there won't be a second wave and we will begin some semblance of normalcy. And so keep praying and keep trusting in God. I leave this promise with you today. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. 
We entitled the sermon today, The Back of the Book. Let us pray. Father, and now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen and amen. I learned a few nursery rhymes when I was just a little boy. Jack and Jill went up a hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. I left school and never heard another word about Jack or Jill, so I moved on. Then one of my favorites, Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, this lamb was sure to go. I had never seen snow, so I couldn't be bothered with Mary or the lamb. Then I learned this beauty. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty back together again. And I left elementary school, I left high school, I left college and seminary wondering why all those people, the king's doctors, the king's nurses, the king's guards, the king's servants, the king's men, no one could fix Humpty Dumpty. What about Humpty Dumpty's broken parts that was so different from everyone else? So several years ago, I finished my seminary training. Sister Casimir and I were having a, a serious discussion and I gave an example about Humpty Dumpty's inability to be put back together. And it was then for the first time I learned that Humpty Dumpty was an egg. When I open the Word of God and I begin to read the book of Genesis, I often I'm reminded of Humpty Dumpty. How God created Adam in his own image and his own likeness. How my God scooped up some clay and began and bent down and meticulously formed the features of a man. Then God put Adam to sleep and he took a rib from Adam and created Eve. God placed them in the garden and told them to care for the garden, to be fruitful and multiply and, repop and populate the earth, Genesis 1, 26 to 31. Let's turn in our Bibles, the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. And I read, and God said, let us make man in our own image. Let us, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created. Male and female. And God blessed God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. The Bible says, verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was not just good, but this time he said it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. The front of the book starts out extremely well. But one day Satan, speaking through the serpent, had a convincing dialogue with Eve. And she and Adam disobeyed God. And such was the result of their disobedience. Sin caused a separation between God and man, and God had to respond quickly. So God responded, Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. 
Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man out of the garden, the man and the woman, and he placed at the east of the garden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the man and the woman out of the garden. And so as you read the book of Genesis, you will conclude quickly that in the front of the book that Jack fell down and broke his crown. You will conclude quickly that Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Sin and Satan seem victorious in the front of the book. Then came Noah. And the Bible says that the wickedness of man was great. It was not just bad, but it was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. People were deeply rooted in corruption. Iniquity was widespread. The Bible writer says that evil was so rampant and it was a part of their daily lives that the Bible writer says continually. Ignatius, a church father, says that in those days, prizes were given to anyone who came up with a new wicked idea. The people were clamoring for new wickedness. I, I said new wickedness. They were tired of doing the same old wickedness, the same old sin. Their thirst was for newer, more exciting, and more appetizing sins. Bring them on, they said. Bring them on continually. Bring them in the morning. Bring them at noon. Bring them in the evening. Just keep on bringing new evils and new evil things for us to do. And the Bible says that things were so bad, so out of control in the front of the book, that it repented God. You look at the Hebrew word here. The Hebrew word here means more accurately translated, God groaned. God lamented. It grieved God's heart, the Bible says, that God's heart was so grieved and the mess was so distasteful that God had to destroy mankind before he destroyed himself. Humpty Dumpty had fallen off the wall. Jack fell down and broke his crown. Not long after, as the population increased again, history repeated itself. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 and 21, the Bible says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and because their sin is very grievous, God said, I, God, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. Licentiousness was raging in Sodom and Gomorrah. Sensual gratification was common. The sons of God were marrying beautiful, ungodly, and unbelieving heathen women. Violence was the order of the day. The laws of God were broken. Evil in the imagination, evil in the thoughts, evil in their hearts, evil in their minds, it was all about evil in Sodom and Gomorrah. And not sometimes, but all the time. And not some citizens, but the majority of them. It doesn't get worse than that. The Bible says that it got so bad that God had to go down there himself and God lodged a complaint against Abraham and those wicked people. God had to go down and sit with Abraham 
and Elijah complained and God and Abraham were face to face and they were fighting over what God should do. Verse 23, it's right here in the Bible. And Abraham drew near and said to God, Abraham is talking to God now. Will thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Like Habakkuk. Habakkuk said, Lord, are you going to destroy, are you going to allow bad people to destroy your people? Abraham said, Lord, will thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? You are God. Peradventure there be 50, and so he begins to negotiate. Peradventure there be 50 righteous within the city. Will thou destroy and not spare the place for 50 righteous that are there? God and Abraham started negotiating. Abraham moved from 50. God said, yes, I'll do it for 50. Abraham said, 45. God said, yes. Abraham said, 30. God said, yes. And, and he made an excuse saying to God, God, I'm not trying to wear out your patience here, but, but how about 20? God said, yes. And finally, he said, 10. God said, yes. Finally, God couldn't find 10, so he had to destroy he had to choose to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Jack fell down and broke his crown. And throughout the Old Testament, we, we looked desperately to see if things would get any better, but to no avail. The front of the book is stressful. The front of the book could be depressing. The front of the book is frustrating. The front of the book is repulsing. The front of the book seems bankrupt. So we go to Isaiah, who said that God would send a lamb who would take away the sins of the world one day, but it could cost him his life. The Bible says he was wounded. The Bible says when he came, he was bruised. The Bible says he was despised. He was rejected. The Bible says he was oppressed. The Bible says he was afflicted. They killed him. They buried him. But there is hope because he will rise from the dusty grave and we say amen and amen and amen. And so with that one ray of hope, we go to the New Testament and turn to the Apostle Paul to hear his opinion. Paul, what do you have to say about the front and the back of the book? We look to see if things get any better before we get frustrated and close the book. We are longing to hear someone picked up Humpty Dumpty and took him to the hospital. Will he remain broken or will we be able to go back on the wall? So we turn with Paul to 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 5. Hear what Paul says about this situation. Listen to Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This know also, Paul is speaking, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Verse 2. For men and women shall be lovers of their, their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to their parents, unthankful and holy, sounds like today, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of that which is good. He continues, traitors, heady, high-minded, high-minded, Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Sounds like today. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And then Paul says, from such, turn away. Paul says, from these people, you children of God, turn away. For you see, more than 2,000 years ago, Paul said that about our world, and it's, only gotten worse. The followers of Jesus are trying to sing their way out on Sabbath mornings in corporate worship, but it doesn't seem to work. 
We sing, we are marching to Zion, but most of us can't even crawl out of our beds on Sabbath mornings to get to Sabbath school. We sing, this is my father's world, why should my heart be sad? But the moment a little trial creeps upon us, we, we want to give up. We want to transfer our membership to another church. We want to cuss, we want to fuss, and threaten to leave the church. And we forget that it is through much trials that we enter into the kingdom of God. We recite, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But most people at our schools, most people at our workplaces don't even know that we are Bible-believing Seventh-day Adventist Christians. We stand in church and we sing, standing on the promises. But when it's time to do the Lord's work, we are nowhere on the premises. We sing, dare to be a Daniel, but we will neither trust nor obey because we, we like Frank Sinatra, we sing, we'll only do it our way. And the book doesn't seem to get much better as we come to the back of the book. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And so there is anxiety. Ah, we are anxious. We are concerned as we come to the back of the book. We are scared. We are uneasy. We are disquieted, even with what's happening in our world right now. What's going on? We are uncomfortable. We are troubled. So somewhat dejected. And like the little boy, we cheat a little and we go to the back of the book. Stories told about a little boy who had a hero that he loved to read about. His hero was always victorious. He would beat up all the bad guys, rescue the victims, save the underdogs, and destroy the oppressed. One night, he was in bed reading about his hero, but this book was different. This book he was reading was different to all the other books that he had read. For you see, in the very first chapter, his hero was captured, beaten and tied up by the bad guys. And they were having a field day. It got worse in the second, third, and fourth chapters of the book. So one night while he was reading, he began to cry. He cried every time he read that his hero was dealt a blow. And his mother, who was passing by and knew her boy very well, heard him crying and got into his room and asked him what was wrong, and he quickly dried the tear and told her absolutely nothing. His book had 10 chapters. So he continued reading chapters 5, 6, and 7. But things got progressively worse as his tears flowed more freely. And so this little boy decided to go to the back of the book, take a peek at the back of the book, the last chapter, and, and there he found out that his hero had escaped and captured the bad guys and gave each one of them a good whooping. So with a smile on his face now, he burst forth with joy and laughter as he went back to chapter 8. And every time the bad guys dealt a blow to his hero, his mother, who was still listening and who was still standing by, now heard the laughter, the joy, and she heard her little boy say, if only you knew what I know. My brothers and sisters, I want to assure you that the old devil knows what you know. So when he reminds you of your past, you tell him, that you know about his future because you have read the back of the book. So like the little boy, we go back to the back of the book to see what will happen to our hero. So we go back to the last chapter and we turn to the second to last chapter, first chapter 21. Verses 1 through 7. This is the back of the book. 
Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Listen to John the Revelator. This is for us. This is the back of the book. There's only one more chapter, chapter 22. But chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. John says, and I saw a new heaven. Somebody ought to say hallelujah just about now. And John said, I saw a new earth. I say amen. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. What else you saw, John? John says, and I. He, he says it twice. And I, John, in case you don't believe it's I, I, John, saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard, what did you hear, John? I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Amen. God shall be with them and be their God. Somebody say amen. God shall wipe away all tears from your eyes. There shall be no more death. Amen. There shall be no sorrow. Amen. There shall be no crying. Amen. Neither shall there be any more pain. Amen. For the former things are passed away. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He that sat upon the throne said, God speaking. Behold, I make all things new. He said unto me, said unto me, John, write them down, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, <clears throat> the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And then lastly, he says, he that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and they shall be my sons and daughters. In the front of the book we read of sin, sickness and sadness. But in the back of the book we read of grandeur, gladness and glorification. In the front of the book we read of sin, sickness and sadness. But in the back of the book, we read of grandeur, uh, uh, gladness, and glorification. In the front of the book, we read about the tree we could touch, we could not touch. In the back of the book, there's another tree that can be touched. The, the leaves of this tree are for the healing of the nation. In the front of the book, Adam and Eve are hiding themselves from the presence of God. But in the back of the book, we shall all forever be in the presence of the Lord because in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. In the back of the book, we read about the struggles of the woman. But in the back of the book, Jesus is coming back to take the woman as his bride. And I say, praise the Lord. In the front of the book, he is just the king of the Jews. But in the back of the book, he is king of kings and lord of lords. In the front of the book, he cursed the ground. But in the back of the book, the same ground will be covered with gold, and we shall walk on streets of gold. Oh, my brothers and sisters, you've got to go to the back of the book every now and then, because in the front of the book, Adam is told, dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. But in the back of the book, John the Revelator says, and there shall be no more death, no more corona, uh, no more COVID-19, no more Spanish flu, no bubonic plague, no SARS, no pestilence there because Jesus is going to wipe away all tears. And I say, amen, amen, hallelujah. In the front of the book, God sends Adam and Eve out of the garden. But in the back of the book, he invites them to come back into the same garden. In the front of the book, God placed at the east of the garden cherubims with flaming swords to keep them out of the garden. But in the back of the book, God built a whole city for us with 12 gates, three gates in the east and three gates in the west and three gates in the north and three gates way down south where the gates swing outward never. 
or you have to go to the back of the book sometimes because in the front of the book we learn that Jesus, our hero, the Lamb of God, will be slain and we lose hope and we say, poor Jesus, as our hearts are crushed. But in the back of the book we see Jesus coming back as King of kings and Lord of lords with thousands and thousands, a retinue of angels, and we see him sitting on his white horse and as we peep in the back of the book, and see him in all of his glory. We see him victorious. We see him riding. We say, ride on, King Jesus. No man can hinder me. Ride on, King Jesus. No man can hinder me. In the front of the book, he's on a cruel cross, and soldiers are gambling for his God. But in the back of the book, every one of us will have to take a knee, the Bible says. Taking a knee didn't start there. Now, recently, everyone will have to take a knee. For the Bible says, everyone shall bow their knees. Everyone, for every knee shall bow, and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the front of the book, there is sin. But in the back of the book, there is salvation because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, and we say amen and amen. In the front of the book, the Bible says that it repented God that he made man. But in the back of the book, when God's children stand on the sea of glass, God will see the travail of his soul and God will be satisfied. Praise the Lord. In front of the book, we see the garden going up. But in the back of the book, we see a new heaven and a new earth coming down from God out of heaven. Finally, in the front of the book, because of sin, we cannot see the face of God. But we praise God for the back of the book because the back of the book says that one day we shall behold him face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Amen. So during this Corona-19 pandemic, while we are all in lockdown mode, when you get discouraged, go to the back of the book. When you are anxious, Go to the back of the book. When you are depressed, go to the back of the book. When you are homesick, go to the back of the book. When you get cabin fever, go to the back of the book. When you are afraid, go to the back of the book. When you are lonely, go to the back of the book. And when you need affirmation and when you need assurance, go to the back of the book. And if you are still concerned and afraid, then listen to what Jesus himself says as I close. In the New Testament, there's the old, there's the new. We are going to the New Testament. The last book of the New Testament. The last book of the Bible. The last chapters of the Bible. The second to the last verse in the second to the last chapter, hear what he says. We're talking about chapter 22, verse 20 of Revelation. He which testify these things say, ah, he which testify these things saith. This is Jesus speaking now. The second to the last verse in the Bible. Jesus says, surely, truly, I come quickly. That's what Jesus says. Truly, I come quickly, and it ends, amen. So be it, Lord. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So my nursery rhyme got new perspective. Now I recite, Jack and Jill went up a hill to fetch a pail of water. 
Jack fell down and broke his crown, but those Adventists fix it after. And Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Some Christians who love Jesus meticulously and lovingly put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And he was truly impressed as he observed Jesus in each one of them. The back of the book is wonderful. The back of the book has meaning. The back of the book has hope for us. And so as we go through this pandemic, as we go through life, always remember the front of the book may, 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 may be scary. The front of the book may not be good, but, but turn to the back of the book and read Jesus and what he says. And your life will be enriched as we prepare for his soon coming. If it is your desire today to see Jesus in all his glory, and every now and then go to the back of the book, just raise your hand, let, let him see wherever you are, wherever you are. And as you raise your hand, say amen and amen. And amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the word we heard today. Thank you for the fact that the back of the book has glorious implications for your children. Thank you that you have said in Revelation 22, 21, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Keep us faithful and keep us true. And when you come in your kingdom, save us all, we pray, with thanksgiving in the wonderful, precious, powerful, and potent name of Jesus. Let all who are listening say amen and amen and amen. Good afternoon, family. You know, one of the things that I would like to um, uh, confess and admit to openly as a man is that um, for the most part, women are much better at multitasking than we are as men. That's true. Now, I also honestly believe that to be a gift uh, given to them by God, considering the role uh, that uh, they have been called to play in the family structure, and that's a blessing. But you know, generally speaking, a psychologist will tell you that it is not easy for people in general, men or women, are uh, to really focus on multiple important issues at a time. I'll give you a good example. Uh, for months now, um, the one a thing that has grabbed our collective attention uh, has been the spread and impact of the novel coronavirus. But you see, ever since the murder of Mr. George Floyd, our attention has shifted uh, to issues of injustice, and police brutality. Now, keep in mind that the coronavirus is still with us, but focusing on both of these issues equally and at the same time is just not easy. Having said that, you see, we at the Brooklyn Seven Adventist Church, irrespective of what's happening all around us, we know that we cannot afford to lose focus on our mission and on the message of hope through Christ Jesus that we have been called to share. We, we also cannot afford to lose sight of the, the tangible needs of so many in our communities, uh, people who continue to struggle during these difficult times. That is why we are asking you to please remain focused as well. Uh, we need uh, your continued partnership in order for us to meet so many of those needs. That is why I'm inviting you to please take a moment, uh, go to our website at brooklynsda.org slash give and register your donation today. Uh, if you want to mail it in, mail it to uh, 1260 Ocean Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11230 Attention Treasury. In uh, Luke chapter 6, Verse 38, I believe. Jesus said, have a giving attitude in all that you do, and you'll get back more than you give. God will return blessing to you abundantly, packed in and flowing over, because whatever you give out to others will be, give, will be given back to you. 
Beloved, that right here is the word of God. So let it be so for you and for me. God bless you. Before you go ahead and close this video, I want you to do two things. Just two. Like this video and share it with a friend. Someone needs to hear what was preached today. We'll be here at the same time next week at 12 30. Enjoy. Cause I heard it from the street called the priest, yeah. On how God is loving how man can be clean.